Lord, prepare me to be a sanctuary, pure and holy, tried and true, with thanksgiving. I'll be a living sanctuary. sing if you want. Lord, prepare me to be a sanctuary, pure and holy, tried and true, with thanksgiving. I'll be a living sanctuary. Lord, prepare me to be a sanctuary, pure and holy, tried and true, with thanksgiving, I'll be a living sanctuary. Lord, prepare me to be a sanctuary, pure and holy, tried and true, with thanksgiving. I'll be a living sanctuary Welcome in the name of Jesus to the virtual worship of Christ Lutheran Church at the Inner Harbor of Baltimore. As we continue to adapt to the changing circumstances brought on by this virus that has affected our world, this week's worship will be a little different than last week's. For the next few weeks, we will worship in two parts. First, this, which is the live part, which is a chance to gather as a community and interact with one another. A different pastor will lead each week, read the gospel, and offer a reflection. After this part is finished, you're invited to watch a pre-recorded worship clip that includes prayer, some liturgy, and of course our wonderful organists and soloists, um, which I'm sure most of you are longing for after I butchered that very simple acoustic guitar song, and that worship clip can be found on our website, ChristInnerHarbor.org, or by using the link that will be found in the comments below. When it's time to share the piece during this part of worship, I'll invite you to use that comment section um, if you're on Facebook in order to interact with each other a little bit. So let's begin to worship with prayer. Holy and gracious God, in the midst of a world that seems to be changing daily, we cling to you as our source of strength and hope. Surround us with your Holy Spirit, give us courage, and project, protect all those whose vital jobs put them in harm's way during this pandemic. Remind us of your presence until we can gather again around font and table. Amen. The Holy Gospel according to John, the 11th chapter. Now a certain man was ill, Lazarus of Bethany, 
the village Mary and her sister Martha lived in. Mary was the one who anointed the Lord with perfume and wiped his feet with her hair. Her brother Lazarus was ill. So the sisters sent a message to Jesus. Lord, he whom you love is ill. But when Jesus heard it, he said, This illness does not lead to death. Rather, it is for God's glory, so that the Son of Man may be glorified through it. Accordingly, though Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus, after having heard that Lazarus was ill, he stayed two days longer in the place where he was. Then again, after this, he said to his disciples, Let us go to Judea again. The disciples said to him, Rabbi, the Jews were just now trying to stone you, and you were going there again? Jesus answered, Are there not twelve hours of daylight? Those who walk during the day do not stumble, because they see the light of this world. But those who walk at night stumble, because the light is not in them. After saying this, he told them, Our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I am going there to awaken him. The disciples said to him, Lord, if he has fallen asleep, he will be all right. Jesus, however, had been speaking about his death but they thought he was referring merely to sleep. Then Jesus told them plainly, Lazarus is dead. For your sake I am glad I was not there, so that you may believe. But let us go to him. Thomas, who was called the twin, said to his fellow disciples, Let us also go, that we may die with him. When Jesus arrived, he found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb four days. Now Bethany was near Jerusalem, some two miles away, and many of the Jews had come to Mary and Martha to console them about their brother. When Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went and met him, while Mary stayed at home. Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But even now, I know that God will give you whatever you ask of him. Jesus said to her, Your brother will rise again. Martha said to him, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection on the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Those who believe in me, even though they die, will live, and everyone who believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? She said to him, Yes, Lord. I believe that you are the Messiah, the Son of God, the one coming into the world. When she had said this, she went back and called her sister Mary and told her privately, The teacher is here and calling for you. And when she heard it, she got up quickly and went to him. Now Jesus had not yet come to the village, but was still at the place where Martha had met him. The Jews who were with her in the house, consoling her, saw Mary get up quickly and go out. They followed her because they thought that she was going to the tomb to weep there. When Mary came where Jesus was and saw him, she knelt at his feet and said to him, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. When Jesus saw her weeping, and the Jews who came with her also saw her weeping, he was greatly disturbed in spirit and deeply moved. He said, Where have you laid him? They said to him, Lord, come and see. Jesus began to weep. So the Jews said, See how he loved him? But some of them said, Could not he who opened the eyes of the blind man have kept this man from dying? Then Jesus, again greatly disturbed, came to the tomb. It was a cave, and a stone was lying against it. Jesus said, Take away the stone. Martha, the sister of the dead man, said to him, Lord, already there is a stench because he has been dead four days. Jesus said to her, Did I not tell you that if you believe, 
you would see the glory of God? So they took away the stone. And Jesus looked upward and said, Father, I thank you for having heard me. I knew that you always hear me, but I have said this for the sake of the crowd standing here, so that they may believe that you sent me. When he had said this, he cried with a loud voice, Lazarus, come out! The dead man came out, his hands and feet bound with strips of cloth, and his face wrapped in a cloth. Jesus said to them, Unbind him and let him go. The Gospel of the Lord. Grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. These are tough days. With every day that passes, we get further instructions on how to keep each other safe, and the instructions become more difficult. Not going to sporting events, not going to school, not going to restaurants, not going to parks, not going to work, not going to church. These things that are at the core of what it means to live in a society are disappearing one by one. And perhaps the hardest thing is that we have no idea when they will return. We're in sort of a holding pattern. And I know that many of us are trying to make the best of it, maybe spending a little more time with our families, maybe trying to pick up a new skill or hobby, like I've been attempting with this little guitar here. But it's tough, my friends. And for those among us who have lost jobs or wages, it's even tougher. And soon, if it hasn't happened already, some among us could lose friends or loved ones to this virus that has rocked our world. The toughest thing. John's Gospel lesson for today tells the story of Lazarus, who dies and is raised from the dead by Jesus. This is also a tough story because it seems like at first Jesus is taking kind of a casual approach to this tragic event. He and his disciples get the word that Lazarus is gravely ill, but he doesn't come to his aid right away. Jesus stays where he is for two more days before beginning the journey to see his sick friend. In fact, he doesn't even begin the journey until Lazarus has died. This doesn't seem very Jesus-like. We know that Jesus has the power to heal, and his friends had asked him to come and provide this gift of healing to Lazarus. But for some reason, Jesus waits. And so when he does finally arrive on the scene, the sisters of Lazarus, Mary and Martha, they're not happy with Jesus. If you had been here, my brother would not have died. They both blurt out these words past the tears. Most of us know this feeling. Perhaps we've even uttered similar words at the bedside of a dying loved one when we longed for healing that never came. Where were you, God? Why couldn't you heal my friend, my daughter, my father? Where were you? Why is this happening? These are the types of questions we're facing now. Why? Why is this happening, God? When will it be over? What will healing for our world look like? How long, O oh Lord, must we cry out in vain? Pastor Judy reminded us last week that while well, these are fair questions to ask, in a time of crisis, God doesn't answer many of them for us. There's no algorithm for what the healing of Jesus looks like, no statistical model that can predict how long our pain will last. The only clear answer is Jesus himself. 
the one who conquers death and the grave, the one whose incarnation forever linked humanity to the Almighty, the one who promises that no matter what trials and tribulations we face, we never face them alone. We never face them alone. When Jesus does arrive on the scene at Mary and Martha's, he's quick to remind them of this eternal promise. Your brother will rise again. That's what he tells Martha, and her display of faith in the face of tragedy is one that we, we all long to emulate. Yes, Lord, I believe, she says. But it's his encounter with Mary at the tomb that for me is even more revelatory of our God. As they go to the place where the body of Lazarus was laid, Jesus himself begins to weep with Mary and those gathered. These are not tears of pity. These are tears of a love that shows a deep care and compassion for humanity. Tears of a God whose heart breaks when ours breaks, who feels the pain that we feel who yearns for peace and prosperity to be the order of the day. The easy thing is to prevent a tragedy in the first place. But what God does is the hard thing, the real thing. Stepping into the places of pain and suffering and transforming them into something good. Which is, of course, how Lazarus's story ends. He doesn't stay in the grave. Although it doesn't happen according to the schedule that others had hoped for, the healing does take place. The stone is ordered moved and the glory of God is revealed. Lazarus, come out. Jesus shouts and it happens. The promise of healing exists for us as well. While we do not know when or exactly what this healing will look like, we know that God never abandons God's people. God never abandons God's people. Whether these tough times last for weeks or for months, we know that the stone will eventually be rolled away. And we, like Lazarus, will go forth unbound. And in the meantime, we can take a lesson from the sisters Mary and Martha. As they watched and they waited, mixed up with fear and anxiety and sadness, clinging to their faith, they also cared for one another. There's a large stone that has shut the doors of our church building for a while. But the church, the people of God, is alive and well. I can see your faces right now. Through calls and messages, you are supporting one another in times of grief and anxiety and uncertainty. Being that source of connection and community that we long for, being the church. You're being creative and flexible as we're trying new things to get through this tough time. A reminder that the Holy Spirit is not confined to the walls of a building. The Holy Spirit is indeed alive in our scattered midst. And most importantly, you are keeping that hope alive a testament to the faithfulness of God. This is the church. And so for now, we wait for that day when we can join together again at font and table with hymns and songs of praise, that day when Jesus calls to us, come out. That day is surely coming. But for now, we watch and wait together. And for that, we can say, Amen.
The peace of Christ be with you always. I invite you to share that peace with one another using the comment sections below. I think it's a great time for us to connect as a community here in this place as we're able. And as y'all are doing that, I'm going to share two things that I think we can all be thankful for. First is a thankful to all of you who have continued providing financially for the congregation through online giving or by mailing in your offering, offerings. At this point, the church office will be staffed but not open to the public from 10 a.m. to 3 p.m. Monday through Friday. Our congregation continues to house homeless women and children, provide these worship and fellowship opportunities, even virtually, opportunities to connect with God and our neighbor. And we continue to plan for a spirit-led future when this time has passed. We can't do these things without your help, and so just a thank you for your generosity. The second is a thank you to the many of you who have been making phone calls and sending cards or emails to your siblings in Christ. A number of you have shared great feedback about new connections that are being made or the strengthening of old bonds. I think it's an incredible testament to what it means to be the scattered church. And remember, if you're not feeling up to it at this time, please mail those slips of paper back to the church office or just call or drop an email to the church office so that we can make sure everyone is being connected. Now, the next piece will be our pre-recorded worship. So as y'all finish up your piece and gathering um, here in this place, I invite you to click on the link below to continue our worship. The Lord bless you now and always. Amen.